Good afternoon, Professor Tarp, and welcome to Trinity College. To begin, if I could ask, what initially attracted you to development economics? At a very young age, I was very interested in what was going on in the world. Um, and, uh, well, as a 10-year-old boy back in my hometown, I was actually selling tickets for the UN. And um, so I was engaged and um, met my wife, my, my to-be wife. Um, we studied. I started studying relatively standard economics. Um, but then gradually I saw developing economics as a way of studying global problems with a focus on, on the poorest people. Uh, we went to the US to study, we got back to Denmark and then suddenly we got an opportunity to go to Swaziland to work. Actually my wife got a job, so I followed. Uh, and then it went from there. Um, so it's a combination of professional interest and a combination of that you have to do something. So there's a bit of activism and a bit of basically that if you really want to think about where are the most challenging uh, issues in social science, well I, I would suggest that it's in development. Bridging the gap between research and policy implementation is notoriously difficult. In your opinion, how can members of the academic community increase the policy impacts of their research? You're right that it is a difficult area. Personally, I think the way to do it is that you actually try to get some experience in, in, in concrete policy situations and contexts. That's, of course, not possible for everybody. But I do believe that, that, that the way to move forward there is essentially that you expose yourself to real life, real policy situations. And at least you get to understand uh, why it is that people and politicians and so on, what, why they do what they do. And once you start understanding that part of uh, the whole system, well, then you're also better able to feed in and think about where it is that you're more concrete and analytical results or studies actually. But it is, uh, it is a challenge. Um, and um, I, I don't think that there's any simple uh, solution. I, I think it has a lot to do uh, with what you actually want to achieve. I think that I think it's a good thing when you actually have a bit of a. I don't want to say that you have to have a mission in everything you do, but but in this particular area, I think it is a useful thing that you have. You want to change something. What role do you think organisations and advocacy groups have in this respect? There, there are lots of organisations across the board, ranging from government institutes to uh, private uh, institutes to uh, NGOs of, of various kinds. I basically feel that we should be engaging in whichever way we can and that's the way to bridge that gap and 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 and, and you do that throughout every day in your in, in your daily life you have possibilities for engaging making yourself heard um, and so on and that be in school that be in university but that can also be in in concrete practical job situations where you just make sure that you engage and you address the topics and you bring them up and you try to get informed about what's actually going on because it is i think one of the things that's very tricky in a lot of this is that, um, unfortunately, there is in lots of debates still a lot of ignorance going around. I mean, people simply don't know. And then often what um, is emerging out of ignorance then turns into semi-established facts, and they're not. So, I mean, keep fighting with those, keep addressing those, and uh, that's what at least what we're trying from, from the UNU wider side is that we're trying to constantly feed in uh, concrete analysis, concrete studies that basically tries to get, get, get the facts straight. And so building on discourse and engaging. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then I suppose this is slightly related that development as a field of study and a process is, is always evolving. And just are there any new ideas or I suppose arguments or movements that you're particularly enthusiastic about kind of looking ahead to the next couple of years? I, I would say that um, what we've, uh, at least now, now maybe I'm speaking more as an economist uh, or development economist, um, we used to say uh, from, the, from the 50s onward that every 10 years there's a new big thing, there's a new paradigm, there's a new something. And then when we uh, turned into the new millennium, then there wasn't really some sort of new thing. Or th there was something about uh, the way in which we go about thinking about impact analysis that was new. But that wasn't really kind of a new paradigm, that was more a new methodology. 
so some of us clearly felt that uh, we were not quite sure. I think that what's coming back now uh, is, and that I find actually quite exciting, is the need for thinking about uh, development strategy in a more holistic way, in understanding that this is not just a matter of a few simple economic fixes, that this is a complex set of investments, policies, uh, initiatives, this is getting the balance between different actors right and so on. Um, and maybe also coupled with the idea that we don't always have ready-made answers. I mean, development is complex. So I would say those kinds of, I mean, that, that sort of more holistic, more comprehensive understanding of what development means, I think is getting back into focus and that I appreciate. I think that's sort of what I would, would see as the most exciting for right now. I mean, in the old days, development planning, for example, had, had a very bad sort of uh, connotation. People didn't like the word because they con connected it with central planning that didn't work and broke down and so on. I think, I think, quite frankly, I think that there are possibilities now for having much more comprehensive discussions about what should be done. So you can call that reinvention maybe, but, but, but putting it in a different context. How do you see the role of global governance institutions like the United Nations changing over the coming years, uh, particularly in the context of global problems like climate change? It, it's very clear that this is one of the most complex and one of the most difficult um, areas of both research and policy because uh, we don't have uh, a, a good glo global governance system. It is messy and it's uh, full of contradictions and there are areas a policy that should be addressed that are not being addressed. Um, I think that if the UN did not exist, it would, we would have to reinvent it. It would have to be there and has to be there because there has to be a forum for uh, discussion, interaction, development of action plans, uh, etc. It is also a fact that sometimes these processes take time, and sometimes it is also a fact that. Uh, there is a lot more to be achieved in climate change and so on. So I, I personally think that uh, the, the, the governance challenge is going to be uh, continuing to be at the center of, of any sort of serious research agenda, trying to come up with proposals. And I would say that it's very clear that when you're looking to the responses to the uh, financial crisis, that that illustrates pretty well um, this sort of issue of, 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 of leadership and, and, and governance not always being up to the task. Do you think that United Nations reform is likely or possibly even necessary? The UN needs to constantly reform. The UN needs to uh, constantly become uh, more effective, uh, more efficient, more targeted. Um, and there are uh, reform initiatives underway and, 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 and I, I support those. I mean. Uh, UN is, a, is an incredibly important institution in terms of focusing on the right issues, uh, etc. But it's also a complex institution and trying to streamline and trying to make the institution effective uh, is, is, is critical. Now, you, you should understand that, 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 that where I'm sitting is that I'm in many ways sitting a little bit outside of the, the institution because WIDER is a research institute and a training institute and it forms part of the UN you, which is United Nations University, but lots of what we do is more sort of a policy think tank type uh, function. I mean, that, that's why, for example, last year or we, we were ranked sixth global uh, international development policy think tank. So we're not so much involved in the, how can you say, day-to-day uh, -day policy processes that are going on in New York and elsewhere. But it is clear that uh, global governance and being able to address the externalities, of, as we as economists would talk about them, in environment, uh, in trade, etc., uh, are, are, are not being addressed the way they should be. I mean, uh, we are having a situation uh, in global food markets where just because a couple of countries put on export bans on their rice exports, that then the prices go completely out of whack which of course have very significant impact in other countries. Those kinds of issues need to have uh, a forum where they can be addressed. But we don't have a comparable situation to national government for the time being. Um, international relations are about how nations interact with each other. 
and in that context, UN is is, is critical. Perfect. Well, I think we're actually unfortunately out of time. So thank you very much. Okay. Very no, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you.